Hi guys, welcome to lesson two of week seven. We're going to talk about representation within his book, uh, The Boy from the Mish. And this is, of course, Stitch playing his guitar. I lovely, love Stitch, one of my favorite films. All right, so we're going to read pages 97 to 100. So if you have a copy of your own, of the, um, of the sections we're going to look at, um, it should be available to download on our Google Classroom. Um, and you can see down here that the page numbers are still here because I just copied and pasted them, like copied and pasted. I just printed them straight off the pages. So I'll be looking at the page number as if it was in the book, not the page number that's in, like, as, as if it's like page one, page two, because that's just confusing. So let's have a look. I'm going to read it out loud, and then we've got some questions at the end. It is a little bit of reading, so it's one, two, three, four, five pages long. Um, but let's have a look. As we approach the bank, I see the Aboriginal men of the men's group. They're behind the trees but reveal themselves as we approach. They've brought with them the younger boys as well. They have paint on their hands and speak quietly to each other. One of the elders, Uncle Charlie, is painting the younger boys' faces. They form a line to meet him. Next to him is Uncle Rex, who I reckon must be about 90 years old now. We land a canoe against the bank. I step out of the shallow water and Thomas does the same. I drag the canoe onto the sand and rest it by a tree. And Thomas follows me up the bank to the group. Kaylin's already started working on the dot painting on the ground. He has a large piece of, of manila cardboard and he dabs the tip of his paintbrush into the small jars of paint beside him and brings the paintbrush to the cardboard with precision and patience. Yanni's painting beside him, but it's a landscape. He applies his strokes in a smooth, steady hand. I've been working on this one, I say to Thomas, pointing to the sheet of canvas resting behind a rock further down the bank. I pull it out to show him. I don't paint too much anymore. Thomas gazes over the canvas. The sketched outline of a turtle surrounded by blue and black dots with its shell at the center of the sheep. Wow, Tom says. It's nice. His voice quivers. I kneel on the grass and grab the thin paintbrush that rests beside the rock. Taking the canvas over to Kaylin, I dip the brush into the paint beside him, take it to the canvas. Take it to the canvas. I can feel Thomas watching my fingers as I press down and add to the dots around the turtle. I steady my hand and breathing. Why do you just come down here? Thomas asked. He hadn't taken a seat yet. I look out the rest of the men's group. They all look so comfortable and united. There's Daryl painting the white streaks across his son's body. Then Uncle Tita painting, painting his didgeridoo, which he freshly carved from a eucalyptus tree. There's Uncle Rex, who can't do very much in his old age and can't talk, doesn't talk properly anymore. He walks with a walking frame and is always wearing a nice big brown jacket. Even though he's old, I think he gains strength from the men, from the men when he comes to the group. Keeping Uncle Rex company are the brothers Lionel and Eric, painting their own canvases at the bank with their feet resting in the water. They're the best footy players in the Mish. I remember Mum once saying they reminded her of Anthony Mundine and Nathan Black, Black Doc, sorry, Blacklock during their footy days. But they got a bit mix, mixed up in the drugs and the drinking. The stories I heard about them don't sound too good. Then Uncle Charlie got them to meet with the men's group, and they're doing alright these days, I think. We're a big family. Each of us related, familiar. Even the young boys love being painted up and always eager to learn their dances from Uncle Charlie, even though they get super shy sometimes. It's healing for us. The older ones, the younger ones, some of us have problems with drugs, grog, family, relationships. Coming here and painting with the other boys heals us. Sometimes we go fishing and camping. It's men's business. We're out on country, on the water. We reconnect with our spirituality. Tom sits down beside me. Do you need healing? He asks. Sometimes, I reply. Uncle Charlie calls us all together. We leave our paintings and come together on the bank. We sit in a circle on the sandy dirt, Thomas beside me. He edges his knee towards mine, and I can feel our hairs touching each other ever so slightly. Uncle Charlie wears his button blue shirt and broad brimmed hat, which is decorated with an emu feather. He holds his bucket in front of him, which is filled with gum leaves. It's been a tough year for a lot of you boys, he says. We've lost people, we've gotten into trouble, and gone through some hard, bad times. But each of us turning up here today, that shows our strength. That shows the importance of this group and how we must stay together and stay united. If not for us, for the little ones. He points to the younger boys who are all painted up now. Don't those fellas look deadly? They're our future. We need to show them the way. Because our culture isn't getting any younger, but it can always get stronger. We're all silent. We always shut up and listen to Uncle Charlie when he speaks. What's your name, son? Uncle Charlie asks, turning his eyes to Thomas. Thomas? he says, and his voice is so light and croaky. Where are you from, Thomas? Penrith, Thomas says. Uncle Charlie smiles. 
Do you know the country we're pinned with this? Thomas shakes his head. Do you know your totem? Thomas shakes his head again. When you get back to Penrith, you should spend some time with your elders. I won't tell you to do it. That decision has to come from you, but you should go to your elders. You should ask them about your country, your totem, because that is your identity. A black fellow with no identity is a lost black fellow. He doesn't know where he belongs. I don't know my elders, Thomas says. The whole group is quiet. I don't know my mob. You don't know your mob? Uncle Charlie asks. No, not really. One of my caseworkers tried to connect me with things, but I didn't care. None of that really mattered. I just wanted to have fun. Then I ended up in lockup. Thomas' voice is so tender, we're breaking the wind. When I got out, they put me with Jackson's Arnie. She'll show you the way, Thomas, Uncle Charlie says. You just have to ask, and when she answers, listen to her. You've been in trouble, done the wrong thing, made mistakes. But it doesn't have to be who you are. We all make mistakes. It's just a part of life. We all grow a little bit every day. As I listen, I begin to think Uncle Charlie should write a book or something. I'll go on speaking to her. You just have to make the decisions, he continues. You can make a better future for yourself. Thomas doesn't respond. The rest of the group stays quiet. Uncle Charlie pulls a matchbox from his pocket. He ignites one of the matches and drops into the bucket of gum leaves, not- which crackle with the fire. Smoke starts to bellow from the rim. Come to the smoke, Thomas, Uncle Charlie says. Let it cleanse you of the bad spirits. Thomas stays sitting for a moment then stands at the encouragement of Lionel. Uncle Charlie stands to greet him in the centre of the circle. He places the bucket on the ground. What do I do? Do what I do, he said to Thomas. He used his hands to wash the smoke over his body. Thomas imitates him, washing the smoke over himself. He walks back to his seats and smiles, though I can see he's trying not to. That was pretty cool, he whispers to me. And one by one, the rest of us take turns, stepping through the smoke, waving it over ourselves and letting the smell sink into our skin. And then Uncle Tita starts a small fire, and we have a feed of sausage sandwiches. All right, so in that little section there, um, we have Thomas and Jackson. They are going to a, uh, a meetup of the men's group, of all the men in the community. They come together, and we can see a lot of different activities are happening at the same time. Okay, we've got some painting going on. Some of the older guys are painting um, symbols onto the younger guy's skin. They have a smoke ceremony, which is really important in Indigenous culture, and it opens almost every ceremony um, that they have. It's basically to spread, um, to get rid of the bad juju in the area. That's what a smoke ceremony is for. And we see Thomas experience that for the first time. So let's have a look at these questions. One, what is the didgeridoo made of and who is painting it? Who is Anthony Mundine and Nathan Bad Blacklock? Are they good idols for the Indigenous community? That's your choice. Um, just do a little bit of a Google search on Anthony Mundine and Nathan Blacklock and see if you think they're a good um, mentors for Indigenous people. Three is why does Jackson and the other younger boys come to men's group? Four is a quote, don't these fellas look deadly? In Indigenous speak, what does deadly mean? Five, how does everyone treat Thomas? What does that say about Indigenous culture? Six, after speaking to Thomas, Uncle Charlie says, a black fellow with no identity is a lost black fellow. You don't know where you belong. Think about what you know about the stolen generation and Ali Cobby Ackerman's desire to know her people. Do you think Uncle Charlie makes a good point? So a lot of um, Ali Cobby Ackerman's young adult life was her trying to find her people. It took her like, I think it was like 15 or so years to locate her mother because of the whole stolen generation stuff that was happening. Um, and then most of her poetry is about learning about her life, about being a circle and a square, about trying to um, enhance her life with her Indigenous culture, but never quite leaving behind the people that raised her because she is on good terms with her um, adopted family. So we have a couple of examples in this text about um, the idea of identity and how that can mess with you how a lot of the people come to this these men's groups because it's part of their cultural identity about knowing the other men in the area and doing men, men's business. Um, there is also normally a women's group, which we don't get to see in the book because they, we don't follow a female character, uh, but they will deal with, like, women's business. Um, so, yeah, just think about, like, what do you – do you think Charlie makes a good point when he says, a black fellow with no identity is a lost black fellow. You don't know where he belong. And the smoke – um, ceremony is an important part of, it, of the men's meeting. Explain why. All right, and the last slide, yep, the last slide for this lesson, for lesson two, 
Okay, so in that excerpt we just read, we can see how storytelling, body art, music and painting are important to the Indigenous people in the novel Boy from the Mish. This aspect of Indigenous culture is perhaps the most well-known image we get when we think of what does it mean to be an Indigenous Australian. If I asked you guys to think of Indigenous Australians, you normally would consider, um, obviously, the darker skin, the white uh, body paint, the um, ceremonies they do, the dances they do. Um, if you've ever been to um, some sort of ceremony at the school that's being led by um, an Indigenous elder, you might have a stronger idea um, than other people. But it's definitely the strongest image that comes to our mind, like that sound of didgeridoos and eucalyptus um, trees everywhere. So on in this slide here, there's a video. Um, if the link doesn't work for you guys, um, you can just Google Storm Boy 1976 Indigenous Dance and it'll come up. Uh, so the video from YouTube is from a movie Storm Boy that was released in 1976. Make sure you are watching the one from 1976 because it was re remade recently and it's it doesn't, it's just not as good. Uh, where one of the characters is sharing a dreaming story about how the pelican, where the pelican came from. So the dreaming story is like their religion. It is their um, idea of how the world came to be the way it is and of course they have stories about how all the animals came to be and um the character from the movie shares the story about the dream um sorry about where the pelican came from so during the story he's painting his face and acting out natural movements of the bird so he's doing a dance he tells a story and he's also doing the face painting uh knowing that passing on stories and art that accompany that accompanies it what does this tell you about indigenous culture so when he tells his story it's not just him telling a story okay he's got the body art on himself he is doing movement about dancers um he's got a story that goes along with it okay so what does that tell us about indigenous culture and their need to tell stories to pass on um their beliefs in their society and their culture uh, last activity okay this is our book week activity so last lesson i got you to describe the theme Okay, so this time I'm going to ask you to create a character that would live in this world depicted in the poster. Take into consideration the people you see, the different objects in the air, and the vibrant colours of the natural world. So really the only bright colours we have is these artificial ones in the air, but we also have these lovely red poppies down the bottom here with this rich green grass. Um, so I want you to think about what sort of character could live in this, this world here. Also look at the people we already have. So I don't think any of the characters will be wearing um, bright leotards or anything like that. Okay, even the child is in a muted uh, brownie grey colour. And that's the end of lesson two. And I'll see you all in the last lesson in a few moments. Bye.